<laughs> okay, let's see who showed up because we got a couple more. Oh, Carol's here. Hello, Carol. And right to her left is Julie. Hi, Julie. Yeah, good to see you, Julie. So um, here we are on Ash Wednesday. Oh. Anybody got your ashes? I can't see any smudges here. No, no smudges? All right. We did ashes on Sunday. I don't know if any of you were streaming or were with us. You saw that uh, we did some ashes. I know a few of you got smudged. So that's great. That's good. Can't believe Can I ask, that it's already Ash Wednesday. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, I didn't put any of the ash on on last Sunday. Can't, is there a way that I can still do that? You talk to Scott. Pastor Scott will set you up. Thank you. We'll take care of you this Sunday, Linda. There you Thank go. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, anybody who would like to, we decided to do it the, the Sunday before because yeah. it wouldn't be so anticlimactic and a little closer to Ash Wednesday. But uh, yeah, Scott will take care of you. Yeah. Yeah, before the pandemic, we were actually doing it on Ash Wednesday because this group met in person. And so we got to do that. So yeah, I can't believe it's already Lent. Crazy. Okay, um, we, for those of you who missed last week, we started doing things a little bit differently, just and we're going to do more contiguous reading. A couple of people had said it was getting so broken up that it was hard to really follow or get the context. So we're going to read through, you know, two, three pages-ish, something like that, and then we'll stop and break. And I'll ask and see if anybody has any, you know, comments or questions interpretations, things they'd like to talk about. And then uh, depending on how that goes, I'll jump in with some of my own as well. But it, it seemed to work pretty well last week. <clears throat> we got the reading in and then we took off on a, a lot of good discussion. So hopefully that'll be the case again. But feel free to uh, interrupt as needed if something doesn't make sense. But we'll do a little bit more reading this time. We're still in the introduction. <clears throat> so this is page 18 in Roman numerals. XVIII, -I -I, if you can find that. And we are starting right at the chapter header, or the, uh, the break there, the way up and the way down will be where we start. And before we get reading, anything anybody wanted to bring up? Any old business, new business, anything we need to discuss? You know, I have a question. My book does not have all those introduction pages. Does anybody else not have all those? Mine only goes to 10. To 10? Uh, mm -hmm. in, in Roman numerals? Yeah. Oh, well then, does the introduction start with regular Arabic numerals? No, the introduction is stops at 10. Yeah, I, I just wondered if anybody else had just a really short one, like I do, but I guess not. Does your first chapter, The Shadow, maybe you have the wrong book. Uh, the introduction is really long. Uh, chapter one is the two halves of life. I have the wrong book. <laughs> okay. Have a, have I have, book. I have this. Isn't this the book? Oh, no, dear. That's, that's two books ago. Oh, she's okay. Well, we, that's, uh, we are this reading. Airheaded Cheryl here ordered the wrong book. Falling, <laughs> falling upward. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and order that right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. But that, that one on the shadow is really good. <laughs> okay, well, I'll read it anyway, since I have it, right? I'm going to order for Amazon, so I have it for next, next week. Thank you. It's, it is a good book. Dave, can you show me it again? Sure. Mm. Falling up here. Okay, thank you. And it's by Richard Rohr. Okay. <laughs> That's why the pages don't line up. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that'll do it, that'll it, do it. I've, had a, I've had a crazy couple of weeks thank you <laughs> you know well we've had all kinds of things Cheryl someone got the paperback and we weren't sure the paperback and the hardback lined up and then someone bought the workbook instead of the actual text and so we've had all kinds of little things going on but I will say this is the first time we had an entirely different book <laughs> yeah that's me so there you go <laughs> all right thank you all right there okay Page 18, the way up and the way down. Here we go. The soul has many secrets. They are only revealed to those who want them and are never completely forced upon us. 
One of the best kept secrets and yet one hidden in plain sight is that the way up is the way down. Or if you prefer, the way down is the way up. This pattern is obvious in all of nature from the very change of seasons and substances on the earth to the 600 million tons of hydrogen that the sun burns every day to light and warm our earth and even to the metabolic laws of dieting or fasting. The down up pattern is constant too in mythology. In stories like that of Persephone, who must descend into the underworld and marry Hades for spring to be reborn. In legends and literature, sacrifice of something to achieve something else is almost the only pattern. Dr. Faust has to sell his soul to the devil to achieve power and knowledge. Sleeping Beauty must sleep for a hundred years before she can receive the prince's kiss. In scripture, we see that the wrestling and wounding of Jacob are necessary for Jacob to become Israel. And the death and resurrection of Jesus are necessary to create Christianity. The loss and renewal pattern is so constant and ubiquitous that it should hardly be called a secret at all. Yet it is still a secret, probably because we do not want to see it. We do not want to embark on a further journey if it feels like going down, especially after we have put so much sound and fury into going up. This is surely the first and primary reason why many people never get to the fullness of their own lives. The supposed achievements of the first half of life have to fall apart and show themselves to be wanting in some way, or we will not move further. Why would we? Normally a job, fortune, or reputation has to be lost. A death has to be suffered. A house has to be flooded, or a disease has to be endured. The pattern, in fact, is so clear that one has to work rather hard or be intellectually lazy to miss the continual lesson. This, of course, was Scott Peck's major insight in his best-selling book, The Road Less Traveled. He told me personally once, name dropper, right? He told me personally once that he felt most Western people, people were just spiritually lazy. And when we are lazy, we stay on the path we are already on even if it is going nowhere. It is the spiritual equivalent of the second law of thermodynamics. Everything winds down unless some outside force winds it back up. True spirituality could be called the outside force, although surprisingly it's found inside, but we'll get to that later. Some kind of falling, what I will soon call necessary suffering, is programmed into the journey. All the sources seem to say it, starting with Adam and Eve and all they represent. Yes, they sinned and were cast out of the Garden of Eden, but from those very acts came consciousness, conscience, and their own further journey. But it all started with transgression. Only people unfamiliar with sacred stories are surprised that they ate the apple. As soon as God told them specifically not to, you know they will. It creates the whole storyline inside of which we can find ourselves. It's not that suffering or failure might happen, or that it will only happen to you if you are bad, which is what religious people often think, or that it will happen to the unfortunate, or to a few in other places, or that you can somehow by cleverness or righteousness avoid it. No, it will happen, and to you, losing, failing, falling, sin, and the suffering that comes from those experiences, all of this is a necessary and even good part of the human journey. As my favorite mystic, Lady Julian of Norwich, put it in her Middle English, sin is behovely. You cannot avoid sin or mistake anyway. But if you try too fervently, it often creates even worse problems. Let me read that again. I didn't do it too well. You cannot avoid sin or mistake anyway, but if you try too fervently, it often creates even worse problems. Jesus loves to tell stories like those of the publican and the Pharisee, and the famous one about the prodigal son, in which one character does his life totally right and is, in fact, wrong, and the other who does it totally wrong 
ends up God's beloved. Now deal with that. Jesus also tells us that there are two groups who are very good at trying to deny or avoid the humiliating surprise. Those who are very rich and those who are very religious. These two groups have very different plans for themselves as they try to totally steer their own ships with well-chosen itineraries. They follow two different ways of going up and avoiding all down. I think that's a pretty good place to, to pause for a moment here. Anybody, if there is something that stuck out at you, if there's just a general impression that you got, if there's a question you have, let's, uh, let's just kick it around a little bit. That was a, a, there's a lot of stuff. These are really dense paragraphs. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, so I'd say, I think you pendulum swung too far the other way now, Dave. You, you practically read the whole book now. I can't get, I, I can't remember. I can't remember the first sentence. Ah, uh, it was three pages, man. Come on. <laughs> Crank the five. Well, well, I, I think, think, go ahead. I wrote down, I think, the first sentence. And it was, uh -huh. the soul has many secrets. I thought that was interesting. I was like, whoa, what's it, what's, where is this going to go next? So when it started, he started talking about uh, Persephone, and, but the soul has many secrets. I'm not sure how the secret part tied into uh, the, the going down to going up. Not sure about that. What do you think? Okay. Anyone want to react to that one? The soul has many secrets. He, label, he, he, he labels one of them, or he gives us one of them. Why do you think that, it, it, and first of all, is that a true statement? Does the soul have secrets? I too was uh, taken back by that because I was about to say how we've, you know, we've learned through our pain and suffering sometimes that, you know, sometimes the most valuable lessons come from some of the most difficult times. And I can certainly share my stories and I'm sure everyone else could too. But um, maybe because we've become somewhat aware of that, I, I didn't look at it as a secret either. So it did seem, uh, as was pointed out, uh, a, a little disjointed, uh, but maybe it's because we've become aware of this uh, through you know the effect and things of this sort. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a secret and now, but it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> Correct. I, I heard it more from the perspective of, you know, there are things about ourselves that are covered up that needs to be unearthed by some degree of suffering that needs to be revealed. Like, I think you use the analogy of like Michelangelo seeing the sculpture in the block of wood or whatever the block of stone and then carving away the unnecessary so i see i was seeing it more in that light mm -hmm. yeah that's exactly the way i was looking at it too. i mean he's being a little poetic here we got to give him a little bit of license right mm -hmm. the soul has many secrets is is, is just a, a poetic way of saying that the deepest truths of life are hidden from our egoic mind, our conscious mind, the one that thinks rationally, you know, and maybe it's because it thinks rationally, we don't see these deep paradoxical truths. The main one being that the way up is the way down. Well, really, Doug said the same thing, didn't he? He said, sometimes the suffering in life is my greatest growth, you know, and, and yet we don't like rationally, we don't think of it that way. It's a secret that the soul knows, that our deepest self knows but we don't consciously have access to it, usually at least on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think it's, it's exactly what, what William said. These things are hidden from ourselves. Yeah, who is it, who is the secret from? Mm -hmm. Well, it's from our, <laughs> our, our noodle, right? It's, a, it's our, our conscious mind. We don't get it and we fight it. He said, he makes that point very strongly later. We don't wanna get it. Too scary. Where, where or does it finally appear to be? Hmm. Where does it finally appear to you? Yeah. <laughs> the uh, next, very next sentence, Linda. Oh, okay. The soul has many secrets. They are only revealed to those who want them and are never, they are never completely forced upon us. 
not only does it reveal to those who want them, but it also it's only revealed to those who are willing to do the work to strip away, like William was talking about, everything that's not Michelangelo's horse standing there in the block of marble. Because remember, the, the, the deepest journey is a journey of subtraction, not addition. It's about stripping away everything that isn't the true self that's already there. We're not looking out there, like Jesus said, kingdom's not out there someplace, it's within. So it's already there. But okay. if you're not willing to do the downward work of stripping away everything that has accrued on top of that true self over the course of your lifetime, then those secrets remain secret. They remain hidden from you. So we have to find ways to get to all those places and deal with them, right? Right. But it's a well-worn path. Yeah. Either in, in psychology or in spirituality, there's, there's, there's different ways of getting at the same truth, but it always involves a stripping away and going down. I think the thing that jumped out to me, Dave, in those couple of paragraphs that were read was, again, I, I kind of jumped to the, you know, our Western culture always reveres the people that are just so successful one after another and all these wonderful criteria that they've achieved in their lives. And on paper, it looks so good that that's the person we really want, you know, to be with or to be like. But we also love the stories, the rags to riches stories, you know, people that are started with nothing and, you know, pulled their bootstraps up and, and you know, fumbled several times and then found their way and learned things along the way. I mean, to me, those are the more interesting stories, but, you know, cautiously, like, as you say, we have to discern the, you know, what makes sense. But, um, I think that's more the real life, but again, the Western culture puts so much pressure on everyone to be this perfect performer and, you know, have this perfect resume of your life out there. And it's just, it's a both end. I don't think it's an either or, but I think it's a both end kind of situation. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. You don't see like a lot of movies, of, you know, just a, a nice failure. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> it's usually disastrous right <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i mean they say like the best you know fbi agents or spies in the movies are always the ex-criminals or the the ones that you know were thieves when they were kids because they know the streets so they are the best trained ones to know all the angles rather than taking right. someone that's just come up the ranks of the perfectly schooled person you right. know they want the person that has the street experience or that has had tough experiences, mm -hmm. I think, for certain things anyway. So I kind of see that as a parallel. But. I, I'd like to share that I was a Christian all my life and felt like I must be doing it right because I wasn't having any suffering. And it, yet it was a, a, almost a borrowed faith until I ended up suffering and the faith, I had to do the work, like Dave said, but it had to become mine. Um, I don't know, <laughs> I didn't expect to get emotional. I'm overtired. But, um, <laughs> but the suffering is when it really becomes something you test and you question and you go through, do I, is this real? Have I been duped? But when God shows up in that depth, that's when it can become more real than ever. And um, you go to a new level of trust. Mm -hmm. How can you trust when you've never really tested it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I um, really enjoyed the simplicity of the statement where he says the death and resurrection of Jesus are necessary to create Christianity. Um, for me, that the simplicity of that is so powerful because it's, it's both ends of what we're speaking about, the death and resurrection. It's the suffering and, and then the joy or maybe it became, it was joy first, and then the suffering came. Um, one way or the other, <clears throat> I can see so clearly how that, the understanding of who Christ is, creates the Christianity that we believe. 
And um, I'm with you, Lindy. I mean, I used to say to myself, and, you know, in the midst of, of the, my 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever that was, and I was like, gosh, I am so fortunate. I still have my parents. No one has died. Everything, wow, how fortunate I am. And then crisis hits. Yeah. And then there you are. <clears throat> and I never realized how strong God was in that mm -hmm. in, until, well, as you know, when my husband passed and I saw the development of my children mm -hmm. and I look back and I think, wow, God, you were in all of it. Yeah. But I was so busy doing and surviving. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a long journey. You know, that was 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I know that that Ryan is still forging forward every day. And I just, I think of it so often because being in that kind of, of uh, world, the smallest, most intimate progress, which we might overlook on a day-to-day -day basis, but when you're in the middle of it is so profound, mm -hmm. you know, oh my gosh, they drank today or something, you know, something, we don't even think about you know how powerful it, yes, it is it, it taught me though to be um looking for the grace in the in that very day and not looking forward to the ultimate healing right to, to trust god day to day no matter what the day has right. and i hadn't had to learn that before it was always about heaven in the future and not about getting to the day, you know, with yeah. the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, powerful stuff. Well, I think it's second half of life stuff, what we're talking about too, mm -hmm. you know, because we didn't have those things to deal with. Now we do, mm -hmm. for sure. If you're in the first half of life, then the tragedies of life, the difficulties that we're talking about, the stripping away is just look at catastrophically. It's just looked at as, as a tragedy, or it's looked at as God's judgment, depending on whether you're religious or not. But it's never really looked at in any kind of constructive way until you start looking at it through second half of life eyes. And that's really the key here. The second half of life, where you're looking in a different direction for meaning and purpose, then you realize the stripping away was a necessary thing. It has to happen. And, and, the, and the truth, when he goes in that second paragraph and he's talking about in legends and literature, and he brings up Persephone, the, the Greek myth uh, you know, of, of the, uh, the goddess of the underworld. And then he talks about Faust and he talks about Sleeping Beauty. And then he moves into scripture and he talks about Jacob and Jesus. The, the shape of those journeys is all exactly the same. And we talked about it over and over again. It's the shape of Jonah and the whale. It's the shape of Moses. It's the shape of of Noah and the ark over and over again, this motif is there, not only in the Bible, but also in all the world's literature. Joseph Campbell called it the monomyth, the hero's journey, the one story that we keep telling ourselves over and over and over again, from Luke Skywalker to Neo and the Matrix. I mean, you just, you know, just go right down the line. But the shape of the journey is that the hero or the heroine has to take this dive into the unknown, into disturbance, has to lose many things before they can complete the task that they need to complete and come back again. Dorothy Gale in The Wizard of Oz, same, same shape of the journey. And yet, in our own lives, we don't make that connection. We don't see how we're the hero of our story, our own life story, and that these, this shape and these tragedies that hit us are there in order to grow us if we can look at them with second half of life eyes. And so that's the transition we're trying to make. Because if there's meaning in the pain, then the pain is overcomable. Otherwise, it's just suffering. But to make that transition, and if you really analyze Jesus' teaching, this is what he's doing over and over again. He's trying us to take a look at life from 180 degrees, different perspective. Because once we can do that, then we can start seeing the secrets of the soul, if we're going to use that, that uh, image, uh, which were completely opaque to us before. We just couldn't see them before.
but we've got to make this, this transition. We've got to shift our perspective to be able to see that. You know? And that third paragraph where he says, yes, yet it is still a secret, probably because we don't want to see it. And therein lies the rub. You know, Kathy brought up the rags to riches stories. Well, we love rags to riches stories, but the true shape of the story is to go from rags to riches to rags again, and then be able to see that that position is offering us something to be able to build back up again. And so it's really in the loss, but we don't want to admit that. And we have all of our religious ways as well as our secular ways of covering that up because we really don't want to go there. I wanted to add something too that I think, I think sometimes the survival skills that we, we put together when we were growing up and into young adulthood and the messages that we, we got from um, schools, parents, um, friends, the authority figures that, that we um, were, uh, that were in charge of us or what have you. And I think that can, it is part of the journey of unlocking that. And, and I think sometimes the suffering is, is a helpful way of bringing that to the forefront but, but not always, you know, because it, I think it depends sometimes on how, or maybe a couple of things on how entrenched those survival skills are um, that has helped you survive and be a successful functioning person in the world. Um, but it's also the, the networks you've developed that either reinforce those survival skills or start to help you to question them, you know, unpack them perhaps, maybe realize that, that they're flawed in some way um, or they're not giving you ex exactly what this hole in your heart is yearning for. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I appreciate the discussion. I think it, it's brought up a lot, of, a lot of those things. And for me, I just wanted to add, add that piece of it that was kind of rumbling around in my head. And that's a great point, Judy. I mean, it is those programs for happiness and survival. It is those core beliefs that uh, is what is covering over the uh, Michelangelo's horse, right? Mm -hmm. Covering over the, the true self that's in there. And they have become such a part of us. We identify so much with them and <laughs> they are our security blankets that to strip those away, that's mm -hmm. hard work. That is terrifying work. And that's why we don't want to see it. We don't want mm -hmm. to see it that way. We don't want to let go of those things. But until we do, then we're never going to be as free as Jesus would have us be, free from the fear that keeps us from the vulnerable connection that is kingdom. Absolutely. How many of you are familiar with Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled? Mm -hmm. The opening sentence of the book, right? Life yeah. is difficult. That's the opening yeah. sentence. Life is difficult. And then as he goes through, he says, but as soon as you accept that it's difficult, then it's not difficult anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's that 180 degree turn, right? That we're trying to make. Life isn't supposed to be idyllic. It's not supposed to be utopia. It's difficult and difficult for a reason and a purpose. Why are we expecting anything else? He makes the, uh, the interesting uh, comment here that most people, at least in the United States, are, are in the West, people are spiritually lazy. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, for me, I got to be Seem there. right to you? Does that seem right to you? Not right. True. <laughs> not to this group. Not to this group. I think this group is not lazy. Like, no, that's I, why we're all here. That's why we're here. Yeah, we're exactly. not we're not judgmental, right? Because we learned that in the last uh, sermon or one before that, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got the big uh, log in our eye and all that, so mm -hmm. we're not allowed to judge, right? I, it's not, it's, <laughs> I I I don't like it a little bit. Um, in that, I think everyone is spiritually lazy until you are forced to not be. Um, 
you know, it's like, uh, I forgot who was sharing early. Uh, was it Cheryl or, no, she's not here. No, Lindy okay. was talking about this earlier. Like, um, and also Julie was, was talking about like, when things are going well, things are going well. There is no reason to not be spiritually lazy. Mm -hmm. you know um so it's it sounds like a criticism but it's it's a reality for us all until we make the downward journey mm. it's the foxhole prayer that's right. when we really hit our knees and are right. begging god for help right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah perhaps it's reality until it's not Right. <laughs> My dad always used to say there are no atheists in a foxhole. <laughs> and you like to move can you move to oh, sorry, Doug, go ahead. No, I I was saying in my world, I think I was believing somehow that because if you live a certain way, that God protects you from the really awful things. And I don't know if I had that conscious perspective but i might have <laughs> that oh, a lot of us did yeah directly <laughs> and that's why things were just blissful and mm. then for no apparent reason a horrible thing was allowed to happen and i had to intellectually i knew that um bad things happen to good people and it's not always something you did that brings it on you, but I had to really wrestle um, with the shock of something horrible really was happening. It wasn't a dream. <laughs> and um, it, it makes you go deep. It makes you question God at first. And then you start saying, okay, you've got my attention. Mm. What am I supposed to be learning in this? And I don't think I ever really paid as close attention. It is maybe laziness or maybe that I just didn't have the ability to focus like I had the ability to focus in the middle of the intense situation. Mm -hmm. Good point. I think I've always been the prodigal. Always. My whole life I've been the prodigal. And I think what I'm hearing is someone that is not the prodigal that, that maybe was the older brother that was always doing everything right and then suddenly something you know wasn't working and i'm just i would love to know what happened after the party with the pro with the prodigal son and the brother and the dad <laughs> <laughs> what happened after do you agree with what i'm saying though or is that true or not true <clears throat> for me i'm sorry what, yeah for you question? i didn't hear your question sandy oh well, i'm like because i think what i'm hearing from someone that never had any struggles to me, I'm just wondering if that is like the older brother role. Okay. And for me, I've always been the prodigal and always banging my head against something, you know, and really myself, right? Mm. Yeah, I, I avoided conflict. I was the good daughter. I was the good mm -hmm. student. I didn't want to get in trouble. And um, I ended up having even, and I'm, I'm not saying everything was perfect, but um, even though I went through a divorce in my life, I ended up good friends with my ex-husband in a, in a very unusual close friendship and so things always tended to work out and that's not the kind of suffering I'm referring to um, so it was a new level of oh my gosh this is I can't when I wake up in the morning I had to look at it all over again and every day it was you know, my son was hurt. My son was in a coma. It was a very devastating injury. And um, so that's the kind of suffering I just wasn't prepared for. And um, it just forces you to just question everything as the foundation is shaking, you know. But mm -hmm. I've, I've come to believe that that was a good thing, a very necessary thing. And that's why this is all resonating with me, the going down to come up i don't know any other way for you really to to do it until you have something like that come into your life yep and that's the point there is no other way mm -hmm. you know it doesn't have to be something like the tragedy mm -hmm. you experienced it can be something actually much less than that 
but it has to be just as devastating to your sense of self, to your identity that really kicks you into a different way of looking at life. And, and at a different point in life, it doesn't have to be something quite so cataclysmic, but it has to be jarring just enough. And I love Sandy's question, you know, what happened to the elder brother yeah. of the prodigal? Well, I think, you know, it, it, it should have happened the way Lindy experienced it. Something finally kicked the older brother over into realizing that he couldn't do this on his own steam. You know, he couldn't just obey his way into kingdom. You know, he had to be broken as well. And hopefully that's what happened. But Jesus doesn't give us that part of it. It wasn't germane to the point, but uh, yeah. We always want to know the rest of the story, don't we? Hey, I think well, hopefully God, the father loved both of them, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And and that was one thing about the way he put this, you know, that the the uh, the older brother in trying to be right was wrong, the younger brother doing everything wrong, but was God's beloved, but the elder brother was just as much God's beloved as the younger brother. He just didn't realize it. He still thought he had to earn it, you know. Um, Kathy, we we have bulldozed over you a while back. Did you have something you wanted to say? Oh. I was just going to add on to something that Judy said that made me think about the, the childhood things, the authorities we grew up with, and some of the survival skills. Um, I was listening to a podcast recently about Enneagram, and they were talking about how um, people can rewrite their story so that they're not like stuck in the past of what all the negative things were that they grew up with that, that they think define them. And so there was a lot of talking about how you, you can really rewrite your story. And I, I was thinking about that, that that might be part of the second half of life stuff that we end up doing. Mm -hmm. So we start just, you know, let, letting go of some of those survival <laughs> things or the, the lessons we learn that don't make sense anymore by the authorities that we had to follow as children or young adults or whatever. So um, it's, it, it aligned with me thinking about the second half of life stuff that we're doing. So. That's, that's perfect. I, I love talking about lucid dreams, right? If you can wake up inside your dream and realize you're dreaming, you can change the dream. Mm -hmm. You can choose to do something completely different. You can fly like Superman. You can jump like Michael Jordan. You can do whatever you want to do in a dream. It's a dream. But you have to wake up and realize <laughs> that you have a choice that you can make. And I think that's exactly what Kathy's saying in, in different different metaphor but rewriting our story exactly. requires us waking up and realize we can make a literary choice right mm -hmm. i had it a does. therapist once that said i had a therapist once that said to me you can change your past and that was like that didn't make sense to me how can we change the past the past is the past it's history what, what can we change and so i think i see where he was going with that but i had to <laughs> process it for a while first so you can <laughs> that william right <laughs> <laughs> hey Doug, did we uh, we bulldoze over you too, buddy? It was just minor. It was just confirming a little bit what everybody said. The uh, I think you go through the life uh, starting out with the illusion of uh, you know the way it ought to be, and the and you actually have, uh, as Judy said, you you develop tools to make that happen. So um, I think you, you know it's all about addition and success and. So uh, when you said that about the, the breaking point where you, uh, I mean, for me, the revelation was I'm, I, I'm not anything near perfect and that's okay. And life uh, isn't perfect and that's okay. In fact, of course it's not, but I had to, uh, you, I had to experience that. And when I wasn't doing that, I, uh, when I was trying to, you know, be Mr. Uh, Superman Doug, um, and failed, I went into a deep uh, depression. And when I came to the realization that uh, this almost this chant or this mantra of you're not perfect, it's okay. You're not expected to be you know, perfect and life's not perfect and, and accept that. When I was able to do that, all of a sudden, boom, it was the road to uh, uh, the second half of life. But you had to have that failure or that um epiphany. that is that yeah epiphany and it only happens through experience not unfortunately reading it in a book because it would have been nice to have done it that way but. <laughs> <laughs> would that it worked that way right doug 
Yes, it did it work that way. It doesn't work that way. I, so I had to thank, almost be thankful for the very uh, traumatic stuff that went on because if it wasn't for that, it wouldn't be where I am today. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, I watched the the documentary that you guys did, the affected on uh, male suicide. Mm. And did have any of you guys watched it? And what you guys are talking about would just be a beautiful way to add an addition to the end because it was so powerful. It really made me much more aware of the pressure that, you know, that you guys go through and what, and the thoughts that you're, you're feeling when you're going through it and uh, gave me a whole nother perspective. No, that's great that you actually caught that, Sandy. I don't know how many people have actually seen that. It gets a little buried oh. on our site, but. Um... Oh, it was good. Yeah. If any of you are interested, let me know. I can uh, I can send the link out. I wanted to you put it in the chat. I'm sorry. There's a chat right now on the. Um, you can put it in the the, the chat on the Zoom. Actually, it's right on our it's right on our streaming page. The page you can go to to, uh, to log in here or go to on Sunday stream. Just just uh, keep scrolling down and you'll what find another called? window. I'm sorry. What's it called? I'm trying to remember. Do you remember the title of it, Sandy? It, it was, was a it, don't it, male suicide something. Don't male suicide. It was actually yeah. produced by um, by um, another producer uh, who found out about us and and used our people because we have been as a recovery ministry. We've been through it so many times. And uh, Kathy was actually um, Kathy. Were you in it? You were interviewed for it, but you didn't. You ended up on the cutting room floor, didn't you? Derek? The cutting room floor. That's right. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We didn't have any control over that. But um, but yeah, um, Kathy's brother who who uh, took his life was was figuring hugely in this. Uh, but just like taking a look at the reasons and what's going on um, and, and so on and so forth. But it, it, this is has to do with when life takes the downturn. And there's just not enough altitude to be able to get back up again. Um, this is what can happen. And so it's a, it is a, a, a perilous journey, shall we say. Now, going back to are we lazy? You know, I kind of liked where William was going and I was looking at it in somewhat the same way is that I'm sure there's a certain amount of laziness. This is a lot of work. It is so much work. It requires everything of you. That's why Jesus used the imagery he did. He said, if you're not willing to take up your cross daily, every single day, you know, and deny yourself and follow me, then you can't go where I'm going. And it's, it's, it's just takes everything and all your energy. But on the other hand, we in the West are not taught that this is even a value. We're not even taught that this is the shape of the journey at all. We're taught something completely different. We are not taught to, to value um, vulnerability. We're not taught to value what it looks like weakness and so or humility. And so there isn't even a there out there that we're going toward. So I think, yes, there may be a certain amount of inertia and laziness uh, in all of us as human beings. But if our culture is not supporting the actual truth of the journey, as our Western culture does not, then we're really out to lunch because we don't even know where we're supposed to be going. So I think it's a combination of those things. And I'd like to take a little bit of pressure off of us for being lazy and say, mm. hey, <laughs> we don't even know what we're supposed to be doing you know, at this point. Well, when, when you talk about lazy, I think maybe, you know, when I was just going along, I was still pursuing spiritual life. I was still going to church and maybe mm. in a Bible study, maybe having Bible reading time on my own. I wasn't necessarily not pursuing God, but by lazy, it's not challenging what you believe. Mm -hmm. um, taking a chance and saying, you know, what if I listen to somebody else's point of view instead of always wanting to line up right. um, so that you just accept what you've always believed and don't mess with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Lindy, when was the last time a church told you to go ahead and question us and it's go listen to outside opinion? Yeah. See, that, the church is one of the worst offenders here. Yeah. You know, the church is always protecting the, the corporate line. And, and that's the problem. I mean, we have to be encouraged to go out, to make mistakes, to go too far and then pull back. Because yeah. if we don't do that, um, we will never, ever be able to go where Jesus is trying to take us. 
I think maybe, maybe it's better to say we're misinformed or something along those lines. Not bad. And maybe that's a better word. And also, I think uh, to me, one of the discoveries was shame. Uh, you quietly start realizing you don't live up to some expectation and then you, you know, you feel the shame or this reluctance to be vulnerable or to share that, oh gosh, I don't live up to this standard anymore that society is putting on me. And uh, one of the, another revelation to me was, you know, when I feel shame, I say, whoa, I'm not going to feel shame. I'm me and that's the way it is. And, uh, but you had to become aware of that, but that's not something that's taught, um, especially in the first half of life. You're taught, you know, you're misinformed, so. You know what this is making me think of, you guys? I read about a month ago about this lady, a socialite lady, and she's about 90 years old, and she looked at her life in thirds. So she had her social, really wealthy lady, had her families, and then after her husband died, she became a nun. She gave up everything, and that was her last third of life, was that she was going to devote everything, and she... She totally became a nun, barely ever, kids never really heard from her again because they were like silent. And I'm, I have this idea in my head that if I don't do something like that, that, that I'm spiritually lazy. Like, I think that she, I admire her, you know, I'm like, that's right. That's what I should do with the last third of my life, you know? <laughs> and and that's, that's one of the things we really want to work against because it's not that we have to do anything like that. It, it's, it's an inward journey. It's not an exterior journey. Now, sometimes the exterior journey is needed to be able to fuel the interior journey. And some people feel they need that kind of extreme expression uh, in their exterior life in order to be able to fuel the interior journey. But we can do this in place. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to change our jobs. We don't have to change our, well, sometimes you have to change our friends, but uh, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. But, but you get my point, it's an interior journey and you get to decide how much of your exterior life you change as a result of that. That was her expression and that's beautiful. If it is, I mean, if she's, if she's not like Thomas Merton said, just making contemplative faces at herself in the mirror, making <laughs> nun-like nun faces at herself in the mirror. I mean, we, we don't know what her real reason for going into religious life was, but we'll assume that it was a beautiful expression of her third have a third of life, but that doesn't mean that we need to do that. And it doesn't mean that there's anything lacking in us or there's anything lazy in us if we aren't completely changing our lives that way. It's an interior transformation that we're looking for. And, and right. we can do that in place. And you can do that whole none thing and not get it. Absolutely. <laughs> That's so true. I mean, I joined the religious, I joined, joined a religious order out of high school, and I quickly learned that people were there for all sorts of reasons, including myself, which had nothing to do with the interior life, you know? It had to do with people who thought that they'd be taken care of better in the, in the religious order because then they wouldn't have to ever pay rent, you know, or worry about raising a family or all the other things that they were trying to avoid or because they were thinking that this was the righteous thing for them to do. And they were looking at uh, some sort of self-aggrandizement, you know, as a result of wearing the habit. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that people do what they do. We don't need to do those things. If we choose to do them, great, as long as it's fueled by the interior transformation. Dave, how was um, the, the fact that I had the five, um, deaths that were really uh, not usual. How did that, you know, doing what you're suggesting, which I'd like to, to, to do, um, would, would that um, that past, would that interfere in any way as far as make moving forward? On Did you say five deaths? Is that what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm so you had five death. people die who were close to you that 
Yeah. That was very devastating. Um, yeah, that, that if it's unprocessed and it's sitting there in your past, uh, it can create blockages for you, emotional blockages and others. Um, or as, as Lindy and Julie have talked about, the losses in their lives are what actually transported them, you know, um, to put words in their mouth, because I know this is how I feel about my transformative event. It becomes a hinge moment in your life and you don't see it except in retrospect where your life actually moved as if on a hinge and starts going in a completely different direction. And you don't realize it at the moment. Um, but if you're willing to keep getting up and breathing through the pain and not giving up and just moving forward, uh, you end up in a very different place. And, uh, and so it depends on how you handle the, the tragedy, how you handle the loss, um, and that you move through it, you don't avoid it, but you feel the pain deeply, but you realize that there is purpose in it as well. I don't feel pain anymore. Okay. It sound like, right, does it? Well, Linda, what I know of you, you're here, dear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you were attracted by a community that is trying to do things at a different level, and you've been just faithfully showing up ever since. So that tells me something about you. And uh, so... I wouldn't worry too much. Just keep doing what you're doing. Right? I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, last paragraph that we read, he says, uh, you can't avoid sin or mistake anyway. But if you try too fervently, it often creates even worse problems. And that's kind of what I was just talking about here. If you really work at not feeling the pain of whatever has happened in your life, if you really work at then after you get hurt, never getting hurt again, putting up those walls and defenses, vowing like, what was it, uh, Scarlet in uh, Gama I, you know, with God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. You know, with God as yeah, my witness, yeah. I'll never be taken advantage of again. I'll never be hurt again. Yeah. So it's uh, that is the kind of thing that then is going to shelve us off from ever being able to get where it is we're trying to go. Jesus tells stories like those of the publican and the Pharisee and the prodigal son. Um, Jesus also tells us there are two groups who are very good at trying to deny or avoid this humiliating surprise. What humiliating surprise that we have to go down before we can go up. Those who are very rich and those who are very religious. Those are the two groups that are the, the best. Jesus says that um, it's easier for um, a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. This is one of the groups that he's calling out. And the other group was the Pharisees. And he had words for them. In fact, you could probably read the the Gospels as one continuous confrontation with the Pharisees as a metaphor for those religious people who had found very, very solid and good ways to avoid this truth, this secret of the soul, this truth that we do have to descend before we can ascend. That vulnerability is a prized position, not something to be avoided. And these two groups have very different plans for themselves as they try to totally steer their own ships with well-chosen itineraries. They follow two different ways of going up and avoiding all down. So it's either with religious righteousness and, and spiritual piety, or it's with physical wealth and, and fame. Um, but either way, it's always going up, always avoiding any kind of failure, avoiding any kind of downturn. As Doug was talking about, trying to stay perfect all the time. But if, if we were successful in being perfect all the time, our purpose here would be completely obliterated as, as a human being. We have to uh, fail. Dave, we, may, we probably don't have enough time. Um, Doug, we've talk, five minutes. <laughs> we've talked about this before, but maybe I'll just touch on it. You know, he, he speaks about mistakes and failures and also sin almost in the same, like a synonym. You know, so, um, I mean, you, you were asking early on what struck out at you. So, I mean, everything we've talked about, you know, the failure, 
the, the Paschal mystery, as you say, going down, going up. But it's interesting talking about uh, a bit about almost embracing sin uh, or just, uh, I'm sure it's saying that just recognizing the imperfection of life and um, the opportunity to learn from failure and not, you know, just changing your expectations. But it was interesting to see the word sin thrown out a few times and we really haven't discussed that. So maybe another time. Mm -hmm. because, you know, and I know, well, and I know, oh, I just say, I know you in the past, you said sin is more uh, maturing, you know, and uh, when we're in a sinful state, we're not, we're ripening and unripe and ripe. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll never forget, uh, I think it was Peter John Corson said, and he described or defined sin as missing the mark, like, a, like an archer aiming for the bullseye and not hitting the bullseye. It's not, and that's why sin is the same for a murderer as somebody that does something less. It's just it's us missing the mark. And the way that we look at it is this horrible thing that, that we have to stay away from. But that was the way that, that Peter John, I think it was him at Calvary, defined it. I thought I never forgot that. Well, that's what the, the linguistic means. thing again, really, which is what Dave's our expert on, <laughs> right? Well, that's what the term actually means, whether it's in Greek or Aramaic, it's, it's, a, it's a missing of the mark. But the question becomes missing the mark of what? You know, we tend to think of sinfulness as unlawfulness, but that's not the point. Missing the mark of the total unity of God is the point. When we are less than completely present, less than completely connected and unified uh, with our moments, with each other, with God's presence, then we are in a state of sin in terms of missing the mark but we're not necessarily unlawful. And we've talked about this. Sometimes you actually have to break the code of the law in order to fulfill the intent of the law. And Jesus talked about that constantly as well. So yeah, sin would be just the state, uh, like, like Doug was saying, the state of being less ripe, less in, in harmony, less in tune, less in the right place at the right time uh, than if you were taba, if you were good. Um, but uh, th this idea of sin, it, it can't be avoided. We can't be perfectly present all the time. And it's in these states of disconnection, when things are stripped away, that we actually get a glimpse of what's really in front of us because all our illusions fall down at the same time. That, that is really the kiss of death for us, is to identify with our illusions. Those, those programs that we were talking about for, for survival and happiness that get built in from earliest childhood, those things that we come to believe about ourselves and life and others, um, that's why judging is so, so devastating to kingdom because it's relying on those standards that only exist in our heads and don't necessarily have anything to do with the outside world or the moment that we're occupying. And so to be willing to do the work of stripping those things away or when life does it for you, to be willing to then pick up that spot on the path where life has dropped you and keep going, rather than scurrying back to the last place that you felt secure. That's tough stuff. That's scary stuff. And that's why so few people do it. And that's what Jesus was referring to when he said that the road is narrow and the gate is constricted that leads to life and very few go that way. He's not talking about heaven here. He's talking about this work, doing this work so that we can live with a, a certain amount of freedom that allows us to just be who we really are. So Dave, uh, yeah. so technically speaking, okay, here I am and we're in this group and we're, we're I guess, you know, um, you invoked God into the group so God would be here. So if I'm thinking something else, if my mind is wandering, technically I'm sitting. <laughs> no, I mean if we're if no if we're going if we're gonna if we're gonna take it to its all logical conclusion, it might, it's not gonna be a big sin. But if if it's missing the mark, if I'm not fully present, fully here, and I'm wondering, ah, I'm looking at my watch, wondering is this gonna end? Hey, I want to go down and get some food or whatever. Technically speaking, that would be a sin, correct? Well, yeah. yeah. But let's let's look at it. This but way. it's not law. It's we're not. I'm not being. I, I mean, if I started saying, "Oh my God, I, I'm now going to burn in hell and stuff like that," that would be wrong. I'm taking it to the wrong. But what it is telling me is like, okay, wait a second. 
you should both you should be here. And if I'm thinking something else, then I'm that well, might, might be by small bit, but I'm still missing it. Yeah. Well, I think we're having communion on Sunday, so you better go to confession on Saturday. <laughs> or uh, yeah. you'll be okay. I'll, I'll, go, uh, I'll go to St. Yeah. Killian's. It's right down the street. <laughs> you know, but I, I, I see that as I see that as being human. I, I think it's oh, like no, I agree, I agree. But when yeah. we're talking about missing the mark, you know, uh -huh. we've all thought about it as something lawful, something that you know is is damnable, or you know, hey, let's throw you in jail or whatever like that. But mm. missing the mark is just that you just missed the mark. So if 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 we consider our group right now a bullseye. And at any point, we're thinking about going to get something to eat, or we're thinking about, oh, gee, I gotta, you know, uh, call somebody else, or oh, you know, I'm gonna, um, you know. Uh, Can I respond to that real quick? Sure. I I think part of missing the mark is being pre present to ourselves. Yeah. In that, it's it's. Like we can be having a conversation in this group, and if my stomach starts to growl, you know, I'm reminded that I need to get some to eat. It doesn't mean I've necessarily disconnected in some way. I can still be fully present and have a thought that's not related to what somebody's talking about in the group. You know, so I wouldn't think about it. It's I think missing the mark is about. It's about awareness and how we use that awareness to connect to ourselves, others, and God. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always in flux, you know. Um, I don't know if that's useful. I think, I think it is, William. And I, I think, you know, I, I like to talk about the 51% a lot. You know, it's not that we're looking for perfection. It's not, it's not about perfection, it's about progress, right? But it is also about crossing the line into 51% because now we are characterized by awareness and presence. That is our character. Yes, we still end up over on the other side because we're always in oscillation, but our character, our fundamental character has changed. And that's the transformation from inside out that we're talking about. And although you know, Frank is technically right, yes, that would be missing the mark if you're not present to a conversation, but it's nothing to feel guilty about. Right. It's just something that if you want to do better next time, then you'll pay more attention next time. You know, but there are also times where we do need to disengage because there's something else and something else we need to think about. We need to think abstractly. You know, it's a balance. Like I think uh, Kathy said a while, it's not either or, it's both and. And so it's striking the balance. Uh, and that's I, I think Frank has, does have a good point that, you know, I, the way I look at it is, is you need to practice meditation. You need, you need to have that as part of your routine. And then when you've got, when you're practicing, you know, kind of keeping your mind silent and being fully aware of what's coming at you, then it should be easier to pay attention, even in a group like this, or in a conversation. So it, it, the way I look at it, it's a muscle that, that needs daily practice to build. And if you find that you're not paying attention, you know, um, you know, then, then it's time to go back and do some more meditation or something. Or so maybe. I, I, I don't think it's just cognitive. I, I think there's some practical physical skills involved. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Dave is just really boring tonight and he should be ignored. There is that possibility. <laughs> All of the above. All, All of the above. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We better stop. It's getting late. This was great, though. Hey, I was as I was thinking about this, you know, Frank made the point, you know, we read through three pages and it's like, yeah, that's a blur that just went by. But if you all have highlighters or have just a pencil with you, just highlight or underline um, sentences or passages as we're going through that stick out at you so you can go back and, and then we can insert them into the discussion later. Uh, as long as you're not afraid of marking up your book then uh, that would be a good way as we're going through for with three or four pages of reading to highlight something and then you can hit it later. But man, we didn't have any trouble tonight. Look at- No, we just, we have to get the pendulum to swing the, a little bit the other way. <laughs> because unfortunately I, ha I have an attention span like a gnat. I mean, it's just- <laughs> Do you have a book, Frank? Do you have a book? 
do. I just don't like to ever write on my books. I like to keep uh, them. Yeah, okay. yeah. So you, don't, you don't have to. I mean, if that's one your, of those. That's your, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never mark my books. They, go, they yeah. gotta look pretty. Well, I don't. I don't like that either. But I'm making an exception. That's your CDO thing, right? OCD, but in the right order. That's God intended. So here we go. I, I've got all this on Kindle. There must be a way where I can highlight stuff. Actually, on. there is. You can. There highlight is. That's what I do. Yeah, but, uh, I don't know how to do it, but you can do it. You yes, you can. can. It's easy. Yeah. Jerry is going to teach John how to highlight our candles. It's easy, so John. You can. All Just right. Green, John. <laughs> okay, save us, Scotty. Scotty, close your prayer, please. Father God, we're so grateful to be here and spend time with each other and really seek out the meanings of the things you put in place and you want us to learn how to treat each other, how to treat a, a world, how to interact with our circumstances and situations. And yes, the soul has mysteries, but as long as we keep our eyes on you, you're faithful to complete the good work in us. We want to take you up on your promises, Lord, and just say how grateful we are that you love us anyway, despite our falling short, missing the mark occasionally. I'm reminded that you said you knit us together in our mother's womb and Obviously, you know everything from the beginning to the end, and you still chose to create us. So thanks for the redeeming value in your eyes, Lord, and help us to live up to what you created us to be and love each other along the way. In Jesus' name we pray and give our thanks and say our amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Great Thank job you. tonight. See you Sunday. Good job. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night, John Boy. <laughs> All right. And Jordana and Linda, good night, ladies. Good night. See you Saturday and Sunday. Bye, yeah. Linda. And bye, um, uh, Dave. See you guys on Sunday. Okay. Bye bye.